Eclipse Lecture Series. My name is Brian Colvin. I'm co-chair of the Eclipse Committee. Um, what we have today, Dr. Katie Duda, who will be doing uh, Russian space propaganda and imagery. Um, Katie? <laughs> How is everybody doing tonight? Good? Awesome? Are we, ex are we excited about tomorrow? Yeah? Do we all have glasses or a plan for glasses? You got to keep those eyes safe. Uh, well, um, welcome. Uh, I hope you all had an opportunity to attend some of the other events uh, that we had this weekend. Uh, the poetry reading that started at 6, uh, Dr. Meng Wang on Friday, um, as well as our physicists yesterday. Um, and then we have more events tomorrow. So um, none of us have class tomorrow. Uh, so, make it a priority to attend one more of these because um, I, I can speak for myself. We put some work into it and uh, yeah, we're excited to share with you what our thoughts are um, sort of related to, uh, to tomorrow's big event. Um, and yeah, let's just pray the, there are no clouds. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, as uh, Brian said, um, I am Dr. Katie Duda. I am the Professor of Western Studies. Uh, in the Department of Anthropology and World Languages. And I did not write the title of my talk. I believe Brian wrote the title of my talk. Uh, but I love the title. And it is Red Stars and Cosmic Dreams, Early Soviet Propaganda and the Space Imaginary. As this talk came together, it really more is about this space imaginary. Um, but it does touch on uh, some of the space propaganda. And that's kind of where I'm going to start tonight. Um, <clears throat> this is my effort to start the talk uh, re future relative to the other content of the talk. The talk is largely going to be focused on the 1910s and the 1920s. Um, but uh, I want to start with perhaps what we might know about the Soviet space program. And m most likely, at least this was my guess, was that we know the winds. Um, perhaps what it, uh, comes to mind when we hear Soviet and space imagination is the USSR's most famous feats during the Cold War in the space race. These, of course, include the launching of Sputnik in orbit in 1957, the Soviet dogs, and more triumphantly, the first cosmonauts. Yuri Gagarin would be the first man in space on April 12, 1961. His comrade, Gamran Titov, would do more than 17 orbits of the planet in August that same year, which was a lot more time in space than the Americans were able to do, uh, even though we, at that point, we had sent two Americans to space. Uh, two years later, Valentina Tereshkova would become the first woman in space. The space program, seen not inaccurately sometimes as an inverse of the development of nuclear weapons, is often understood as being an outpouring of military resources in the wake of World War II in order to stun the capitalist West through technological achievements. However, as I hope to elucidate tonight, the Soviet space program belongs to a tradition that is wild, mystic, and utopic, whose predecessors had meaningful relationships to religion, philosophy, literature, filmmaking, acting, the Bolshevik political project, and themselves founded schools of aesthetics. This talk will primarily focus on, as I've already said, the first 25 years of the 20th century, but it really requires us to remember that within 40 years of the founding of the USSR, the Soviets would launch men and eventually women off the face of the earth and into space. And just a sort of brief, um, Recap, the Soviet Union uh, was founded in 1922. Uh, the Bolshevik Revolutions happens in 1917. Um, and so we have a couple of sort of um, dates that are rattling around kind of in the background of this talk. But as I hope to kind of elucidate, if we t think about space imaginary, it is a Soviet fiction to really put a hard and fast uh, limit between what happened in 1917 and what happened after 19, or sorry, what happened before 1917 and what happened after 1917. Let me just remind us again of everyone that I have mentioned so far. This is our uh, good friend, uh, at least for this talk, one Yuri Gagarin. This is uh, a stamp for, uh, featuring German Titov. And this is the first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova. Before we launch into the wild imagination of the beginning of the 20th century, I want us to consider two aspects from the early 1960s that themselves would be cultural uh, memes moving forward. The first is Gagarin's famous, ca ca fa excuse me, famous catchphrase, Bayechi, off we go. 
Recorded with mission control right after liftoff, the term payekhli, meaning something like off we go or let's go, became synonymous with a newfound optimism in the early 1960s that proved meaningful, if only temporary, in the Khrushchev era Soviet Union. Let me, I want to play a clip for us right now from a, uh, of a song from the early 1970s written and recorded in the wake of Gagarin's early death in 1968. And I want to draw your attention to some facts about the Russian phrase here in just a moment as well. But let's listen to the song. This song has been in my head all weekend. Uh, uh, so now it is in yours. Um, but uh, I want to draw, again, our attention to this phrase, payekhli, translated as, again, off we go in this particular translation. Or, again, you can look it up, I believe, on Wikipedia as off we go, related to Gagarin. Um, and um, in Russian, it has a particular, uh, so I'm going to bring my Russian language teacher hat for a moment and hopefully make all those Russian language students who I bribed to come to the talk tonight worth your while. But this is a past tense verb. It is a perfective verb, and it is one of the many verbs in Russian that mean to go. It is vehicular motion. Um, and Russian has this ability in this kind of colloquial expression to use the past tense verb of go, sorry, the past tense of go verbs to express a sense of urgency and excitement to get the task or event started. And I think that is worth dwelling on. Uh, this payekhli serves an interesting linguistic entry point to think about a sense of inevitability in the Soviet imagination of going to space. Payekhli, we are so prepared, we are so focused, we are ready as though we have already set off. The second cultural unit is revisiting the Soviet atheism. Revisiting the Soviet atheism uh, in light of reaching space. Uh, replicas of this 1975 poster Vla by Vladimir Menshikov are readily, cheaply, and perpetually available in the, on the internet. By far, it is Menshikov's most famous popular poster in the, po uh, the post-Soviet market. It involves our cosmonaut tethered to his rocket in the realm of the stars uh, over the outsized cupolas of a church and the saying, there is no God. While confusion remains in the market of Soviet kitsch as to which astronaut is depicted in the poster, there is a relationship to the comments that German Titov uh, made during his US tour, uh, one that the cosmonauts took in 19, uh, 1962, when they, drew, they themselves drew attention to Soviet atheism, and by contrast, American religious belief. Here we have, uh, as it was reported in the New York Times on May 6th, he said, no God or angels uh, in his 17 orbits of the Earth. Up to our first orbital flight by Yuri Gagarin, no God helped build our rocket, he said. The rocket was made by our people. I don't believe in God. I believe in man, his strength, his possibilities, and his reason. This projection of atheism onto an international stage was quite ham-fisted, let me tell you. The cosmonauts were really not prepared for actually religious believers and kind of fumbled the ball when asked by actual uh, religious practitioners what this could possibly mean. But likewise, the American projection of belief in God is often read as secondary to a kind of patriotism. What strikes me, though, is how the accomplishments of the Soviet space program were used to settle an internal pro uh, um, polemic of the early 20th century imagination of space that made Khrushchevian, sorry, made a Khrushchev era nation a bit uncomfortable. For many of the figures we will examine this evening, space was where human beings were to work out divine imperative to conquer nature, to conquer death, and to fulfill the human potential of immortality. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union did not want to return to a discussion of an immortal soul and a relationship of human beings to nature in its ecological and ethical implications. And, <coughs> excuse me, despite using the discoveries of those for whom these questions were paramount. 
So let me introduce the players that I particularly care about tonight. <coughs> Oops, where'd you go? There we go. Uh, we will concentrate on four of them. Two of them will be treated as a pair, that is uh, Alexei Tolstoy and Yakov Pratazanov. Um, and uh, if I have time, um, I'm going to look at uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin as a kind of coda um, to this discussion. Um, and talk a little bit about why Zamyatin doesn't quite fit into this discussion of a Soviet space imaginary, but for the students who uh, took um, uh, adventures in Soviet imagination with me last year, um, and if you are interested in such a class, such a class will be offered in the spring of 2025, uh, but um, you, uh, this, this, this is the text that we read together that probably is most relevant to the discussion tonight. Um, I want to warn everyone that this is very much an introduction to these themes. There are a lot of isms at play at this stage, um, and they represent rich canons of text and cultural products. Um, we are also focusing on a time period that was very international. Um, I don't know if any time period can be considered not very international, but I am very heightenedly aware of this particular time period as being quite international. Uh, many of these people spoke and read many languages and had access to works from German, French, and English. Likewise, the early Bolshevik state had uh, aspirations to induce communism on the world stage and had relationships with counterparts in many corners of the world. <clears throat> now that my caveats are out of the way, there are probably more caveats and I will caveat away until the end of the evening, uh, let's introduce our players. We have one, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. Um, I will... Uh, uh, let everyone know that I believe this might be one of the harder surnames to say, uh, so give yourself grace. Um, then we will talk about Alexander Bogdanov, um, and then we will talk about Alexei Tolstoy and Yakov Pratazanov, um, and we will come back uh, to Evgeny Zamyatin, who again does not quite fit into this um, uh, schemata, but is someone I, uh, like I said, have read with students, and I do know he resonates very strongly with readers. Um, the four represent different sources and embody different elements of, young, uh, of the young Bolshevik space imagination. But to say they only brought one clearly delineated thing to the table would be absolutely false. They were all inspired through imagination and then used imagination to promulgate ideas they thought vital. They also left valuable markers that echo in Gagarin's Payekhli. We have gone and off we go. So let us begin with Tsiolkovsky. Uh, first, um, I think there's an off chance that people interested in astrophysics or aeronautics would recognize him or at least his contributions. Um, he is also the least Bolsheviki of our bunch tonight. Um, he is one of the three founders of modern rocketry. Uh, those three founders did not work uh, with one another, they worked independently. We have, um, by sort of canon, we have a Russian founder, an American founder, and a German founder, or I would say a Romanian German founder. Um, of his many um, sort of and varied contributions uh, to modern uh, rocketry, we, uh, he calculated escape velocity, he argued for multi-stage ro uh, rocket using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and he postulated pressurized spacesuits. Um, Tsiolkovsky is a kind of amazing testament to what it means to be self-taught. Um, as I say here on the slide, he contracted scarlet fever at the age of 10 um, and lost his hearing as a result. And consequently, because the schooling at the time was rather limited in his resources, he was more or less um, ex uh, excused from all future uh, um, formal schooling. And so he took on really a kind of autodidact autodidact personality from a very young age where he read and read and read. Um, when he was um, in his 20s, it might have been a little bit earlier, so take this, this just was the first uh, year that I saw it attested to, um, he met a man named Nikolai Fyodorov. Uh, Fyodorov is a interesting um, figure in uh, the late 19th century. Um, he was a deeply religious believer, had a big fight, public fight with Tolstoy about the importance of maintaining orthodox uh, ritual, but he also was a founder of this um, set of ideas called cosmism, and I will come back to those ideas here in just a moment. 
Um, uh, back to Tsiolkovsky, he moved to a town of Kaluga in 1882, and that is important because he never really leaves that town after that, despite, again, living for, uh, actually, for a decent old age. Um, he remained in Kaluga and taught primarily at a, um, at a girls' school. Um, he taught math, he taught physics, he taught math being both uh, arithmetic and geometry. Um, but for the most part, he led a fairly ascetic life, really focused on scientific experimentation and writing. In, so we're going to move a little bit to talk about sort of Tsiolkovsky's ideas here and uh, what not only did his um, mathematical contributions uh, mean to a, a space program, but really what kind of figure was Tsiolkovsky and how he represents this very uh, um, really brief figure in the life of the 20th century that was captured a, a, a short-lived but burgeoning bourgeois life here before the revolution. In 1911, Tsiolkovsky wrote, at first we inevitably have an idea, a fantasy, a fairy tale, and then comes scientific calculation. Finally, execution crowns the thought. Tsiolkovsky felt indebted to fiction. Specifically, he felt indebted to Jules Verne. Uh, Verne was considered, at least not in any official way, but in an unofficial way, was considered the most uh, translated into Russian foreign uh, author um, in the late 19th century. Um, and uh, Tsiolkovsky very much calls on Verne as an inspiration for his work on rockets. But also Tsiolkovsky very much thought that fiction's purpose was a way to help others imagine and understand technical and scientific themes. So much so that Tsiolkovsky tried three times to write three different science fiction novels. Um, uh, it would be, I would be hard pressed to recommend them to anyone, either in terms of their explanatory value or in terms of their literary merit. Uh, but it is interesting that this was a project he came back to three times, not three times in like a year. He came back to them three times at three different, uh, in three different uh, uh, decades of his life here. Um, and so it, but, and so even though he, he himself was not a successful, um, uh, um, science fiction author, um, uh, the Soviets did republish all of his science fiction, so they're very available in Russian. Um, but um, his, his, uh, his presence and his sort of survival into the 1930s is really a testament to how popular fiction was working at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and it's really a kind of remarkable feat that his, um, for lack of a better word, uh, groupies really maintain Solkovsky's um, uh, reputation such that um, his writing was preserved even as journals uh, where his writing originally appeared would, were going under or were being taken over, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> And he had fairly limited access to publishing, and I'll t explain why in just a second. And so his ideas really were circulated in amateur societies, often among others who were intrigued by particularly science fiction. Um, Tsiolkovsky was not a Bolshevik. Um, he was not interested in that revolutionary project whatsoever. I think some places I read um, that have uh, sort of cursory bi biographies of Tsiolkovsky, NASA, the European uh, space website as well, might mention that he, um, in, uh, what is, I cannot remember exactly the wording, but he um, embraced the Bolshevik Revolution, which is often, I think, um, if, if you look at figures of the early 20th century, is often a key just for saying something along the lines of, eh, their life kind of sucked under the empire, and so why not embrace the Bolsheviks? Um, very often, people did not feel like they had much of a choice because of the way those sides were kind of laid out for them and where they thought they could make a difference here. But Tsiolkovsky was not a revolutionary, certainly not in his own self-conception. As Asif Siddiqui has argued, Tsiolkovsky's success, such, such as it was, was because of the rising bourgeois sensibility in Russia from gradual but a meaningful rise in the rates of literacy to the democratization of informal social organizations and the all too late and unintending loosening of state control over publication. 
And here I will actually quote uh, Queen. Without formal institutions, standards, or communicative media, the science of space travel existed within overlapping and often indistinguishable discursive spaces of science fiction and popular science. Instead of emerging through existing legitimate discipline, such as astronomy or aeronautics, scientific and mathematical uh, meditations on cosmic travel arose as part of an extra scholarly sensibility that was part theory, part fiction, and part popular science. Here, fiction represented a spectrum of imaginary possibilities. Theory circumscribed the physical limits of this imagination, and popular science brought it to, its, uh, brought it to the public as a legitimate epistemology. Nonetheless, Tsiolkovsky's knowledge in search of a science made him ripe for bol a Bolshevik adaptation. Ignored by Tsarist uh, scientific institutions, Tsiolkovsky could not be fostered by an emerging, uh, could only be fostered by an emerging society, uh, society of the Soviet new man. And here I will pause to say we will talk about two major principles kind of running through this paper that the Bolsheviks thought they were bringing to the table. And I argue, um, at least uh, when I ta uh, teach the Soviet imagination class, that these two principles are really two mainstays of a constantly recycling Soviet state project, which is the creation of a new Soviet man, which is again an open-ended question for each new um, attempt to define what that new Soviet man may mean. Um, and also the conquering of nature. And we'll get to that conquering here in just a moment. But so when I say that Sokolovsky could only be fostered by the project of the new Soviet man, this was a self-conscious sort of reframing uh, of Sokolovsky here. Um, it was a fiction, in fact. Bolshevik publishing did little to encourage the fame of Sokolovsky, probably because the latter was always deeply engaged in his own utopic uh, imagination <coughs> and motivations for his, space, for his desired space exploration, looking to build on deeply and famously religious thinkers, like I've already mentioned, of one Nikolai Fyodorov, and unfortunately, eugenic sensibilities as well. As I have already said, Tsiolkovsky met Nikolai Fyodorov, uh, who encouraged Tsiolkovsky's interest in space. Fyodorov also had an interest in space, although his interest in space was less about solving the problem of space, more setting the project of the problem of, of why we needed to solve the problem of space. Fyodorov believed that the resurrection was a project for men to work out and that space would essentially uh, be, uh, sorry, that space would be used essentially in housing and maintaining past generations after the development of this resurrection science. Uh, here I will quote Fyodorov, the conquest of the path to space is an absolute imperative imposed on us as a duty in preparation for the resurrection. We must take possession of new regions of space because there is not enough space on earth to allow coexistence of all the resurrected generations. End quote. Tsiolkovsky, who was not much of a believer himself, uh, was passionate, though, about this idea of immortality and resurrection, um, and agreed with Fyodorov that space was a required destination for colonization uh, through science, and the future of the immortal man would require the conquering of other planets and probably other galaxies. As I have here, Fyodor, or the, um, sorry, Tsiolkovsky's uh, comment here, uh, man will not always stay on Earth. The pursuit of light and, uh, and space will lead him to penetrate the bounds of the atmosphere timidly at first, but in the end to conquer the whole of Soviet space. So once again, in Tsiolkovsky's mind, he has already been to space. We, we as, as human beings, have space as a kind of manifest destiny, going back to, again, our Payekhli. To put Tsiolkovsky's utopian, utopianism at odds with Bolshevik utopias, our next stop will be Alexander Bogdanov, who I will get to in a moment, but I want to leave Tsiolkovsky with an evaluation of his motivation from one Lev Trotsky. Um, and just if we are not familiar with who Lev Trotsky was, he um, was part of the foundational, uh, well, founding members of the Bolshevik state in 1917. And he wrote a lot about culture. Lenin did not write so much about culture. Lenin also gets shot and gets sick, et cetera. He stops writing. But Trotsky, he's, he's writing up a storm. So everybody was listening to Trotsky in the 1920s. 
Cosmism, so back to Trotsky, Cosmism contains, that is this belief that, again, Solkovsky represents, contains the suggestion, a very nearly deserting, uh, sorry, the suggestion of very nearly deserting the complex and difficult problem on Earth so as to escape into interstell interstellar spheres. In this way, Cosmism turns out to quite suddenly be akin to mysticism and may lead some to the most subtle matters, namely to the Holy Ghost. On to Bogdanov. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Bogdanov, uh, also a, <sighs> these men had wild minds, uh, also, also a polymath. Um, he was a, uh, a physician by training. He was way into blood transfusions, which maybe I'll get to at the very end of my uh, little survey of him here. Uh, he was a Bolshevik activist. Um, he had a very, very famous public um, intellectual argument with Lenin in 1909, which he was said to have lost and had been uh, uh, temporarily kicked out of the party. Um, he was somebody who also uh, was a philosopher and probably saw himself most keenly as a philosopher. Um, and his philosophy would um, in no small part sort of uh, it's, it's hard to say this because his, his largest works of philosophy have not been translated into English, but those, of, those people who know them very well talk about his relation as a kind of pro, uh, proto-cybernetic thinker. Um, so he is an interesting thinker when it comes to a, a Bolshevik. He was not a strict materialist, as many Bolsheviks were asked or were asked putting it mildly, uh, were required to be. Um, and um, was somebody who, when he writes his, uh, the first of his two novels in 1908, um, was doing so out of a deep frustration with where the Russian Empire had ended up. The Russian Empire had had a revolution in 1905, and the Tsar had promised some compromises uh, with that 1905 revolution, and pretty much reneged on those compromises pretty quickly. And so this, is, this left Bogdanov a fairly um, uh, sort of jaded man and, um, and he spent, um, at this point, he had already been, um, he had already been exiled within Russia as a student. He went out and uh, participated in some student protests and that got him kicked out of school and, and, and exiled. But at this point, he decides he is going to uh, leave the Russian empire for a bit. Um, in 1913, he publishes a follow-up novel, which is a prequel, um, uh, called Engineer Menu. Um, and then his, his magnum opus, other than this um, love of blood transfusions, um, was this nine-year work that he spends on this three-volume work um, uh, uh, about, um, uh, about his philosophy. Um, he also, when he returns to the Soviet Union, he um, when I say people were kicked out of the party, in, in the sort of early 19, uh, the first decade of the 1900s and second decade of the 1900s, there's a lot of ideological pruning that happens. And then when the revolution actually comes to Russia, uh, Lenin's like, we need all hands on deck. Everybody's back in. I hope we're good friends. Let's ignore what happened uh, in Paris. And um, yeah, that's kind of Bogdanov came in under that auspice, as did Trotsky and other people as well. Um, and so his job within the Soviet Union, or sorry, there's no Soviet Union, in the Bolshevik state is first and foremost, he is trying to be part, uh, a uh, participant of what new Soviet um, culture and what new Soviet aesthetics are going to look like. This lasts for about two years, then the organization is set, shut down. So he then puts all of his final year's effort into his blood transfusion center. Um, he does die by an accident. Well, he liked to perform blood transfusions on himself. He thought it was revitalizing. Um, and then he, uh, in the end of his life, um, gave himself tainted blood, and that was that. So, uh, <clears throat> Bogdanov really deserves uh, his own conference. Um, there's so much of his thought to unpack, um, but tonight I will just focus, and this makes sense of what kind of scholar I am, I will focus on his literary contributions. And in some ways, his liter contribu literary contributions are the thing that made him most famous. There was a, a reprint of these novels um, in 1918 and 1922, um, and these novels themselves um, became a kind of, it's hard to say bestsellers when like, you have limited options in a limiting reading public, but they had, they found quite a readership in those early years. Um, and they very much are a, um, 
they, they read almost as a uh, science fiction or in this Russian term, astronomical roman or the astronomical novel um, as, um, as a kind of myth of the revolution itself. Um, but there's a catch to this here. Um, so our, our protagonist in, in Red Star is a math, uh, yeah, a mathematician, Leonid, um, who is very much just like Bogdanov was himself, frustrated with the outcomes of the 1905 revolution. Leonid is convinced to go to Mars by one engineer, Mieni, a Martian in disguise, and explore the planet. Also, uh, teach Martians about Earth, but that's kind of a secret project that many doesn't tell them right away. Um, as the reader walks aside Leonid, uh, which is most of the second and third parts of the novel, we get to see Mars through his eyes. Um, and it seemingly has achieved greater progress through adopting and deploying something akin to Marxist revolutionary principles. Leonid is fascinated by the daily habits and work uh, the Martians uh, have organized. And here I have one of the um, sort of longer paragraphs of his description. He has a number of, of, of chapters dedicated to observing um, the, the, uh, um, the Martian factory here. So hundreds of workers move confidently among the machines, their footsteps and voices drowned in a sea of sound. There was not a trace of tense uh, anxiety in their faces, whose only expression was one of quiet concentration. There was not, um, they seemed to be inquisitive, learned observers who had no real part in all that was going on around them. It was as if they simply found it interesting to watch how the enormous chunks of metal glided out beneath the transparent dome on moving platforms and fell into the steely embrace of dark, dark monsters where after a cruel game in which they were cracked open by powerful jaws, mauled by hard heavy paws, and, drain, and planed and drilled by sharp flashing claws, small electric railway, railway cars bore them off uh, from the other side of the building in the form of elegant and finely fashioned machine parts. His purpose was a mystery to me. It seemed altogether natural that the steel monster should not harm the small, big-eyed spectators strolling confidently among them. The giants simply scorned the frail humans as uh, a quarry unworthy of their awesome might. To an outsider, the threads connecting the delicate brands of the men uh, with their indestructible organs of the machines were subtle and invisible. <coughs> We, hear, we see here this kind of uh, anthropomorphizing that is quite common of literature of this time. Uh, again, if I have students from the Soviet imagination class, this is the same time that Gorky is writing, uh, which we also saw this anthropomorphized uh, uh, machine. Um, but here we see the way in which the machines have very much dwarfed uh, the humans or the humanoid, uh, the Martians who are working alongside them. And so while in other places many, or sorry, uh, Leonid is, is really taken with the way in which um, labor has been relieved of individuals. They have shortened the labor day. People no longer need to specialize because these machines sort of move, can move um, in such a uh, intuitive fashion that you don't need to be an expert in order to operate these machines. There's still something ominous even here in this early description uh, from Mars. So despite this utopian imagination, there are problems, of course. The Martians have not conquered death, uh, which is a project that Bogdanov himself uh, had, had also sort of engaged in, just like Sokolovsky. Um, and more ominously, um, what he finds out within a few chapters is that the Martians are looking to colonize Earth and Venus. The revelation of these plans leads Leonid to murder one of the Martian mathematicians, forcing him to return to Earth, that is Leonid to return to Earth, and eventually land in a mental institution, crushed by what he did and what he has seen. Like I said, the novel proved incredibly popular in its reprints, but this lack of resolution has always given readers pause, and it was all the more frustrating for readers because Bogdanov goes back and creates a prequel of what Mars, sort of the Martian plan sort of looks like, but he does not create a resolution for Leonid uh, in his return to the subject, and he does write a 1924 poem about it as well, although Leonid does not appear. Um, and so, as I said, uh, Bogdanov was a supporter of the Bolshevik project, um, but nonetheless, we can see something still dystopic about um, his understanding of, or sorry, his vision of how it is being enacted or imagined by his compatriots. Um, 
Scholars like Lauren Graham have argued that this stems from Bogdanov's unique take on colonization of nature and other human beings. So again, I'm going to re sort of uh, highlight this as a principle uh, where, wherein Bogdanov does not abide by this initial imagination that man was to conquer nature. Unlike the Bolshevik maxim of, that, of the one that I just explained, um, and in no small part similar to Tsiolkovsky's belief that man will conquer death, Bogdanov was much more cautious when it came to nature, both human and the, uh, and the natural world. Bogdanov believed that Marxism and its model was more broadly applicable than just, between, uh, just as a way to explain the clash between classes. He had been working hard on a meta-science called tectology and left the world of earthlings and Martians in a lack of synthetic resolution exactly as he felt about this need to better understand the relationship between humans and nature. And so while Bogdanov himself positions himself as a first utopic thinker about space, it is not what uh, people uh, particularly the Soviet um, uh, sort of historical project, if we look at from the 1960s, wanted to remember him for. All right, the last official stop for this evening is with Alexei Tolstoy and Yakov Pratazanov. Um, just, maybe I should have put this on here. Um, Alexei Tolstoy is not, I mean, he's a very distant relation of Lev Tolstoy, but they were, uh, um, they probably really didn't know each other, so I'll just get that one out of the way. Um, Alexei Tolstoy has to be one of the most disliked uh, uh, Soviet authors of the 1920s and 30s, largely because he came from, again, he, he shares this lineage with Lev Tolstoy, so he came from a well-known um, uh, landowning class um, uh, and, and spent a lot of his young life, particularly before the revolution and then uh, even after 1917 abroad. Um, he is the only person that I can point to specifically that tonight that opposed Bolshevism. Um, and so he again uh, emigrated in 1918, but returns to the Soviet Union in 1923, where all of a sudden all of his oppositional stances seem to have disappeared. And this is what makes him hated by his uh, compatriots, uh, because they feel like he very much compromised on some things uh, to get back in the good graces. Um, but it is, uh, uh, Tolstoy worked on sort of two types of novels, and I think his science fiction, uh, as far as I can tell in the 20s, was much more popular. The other type of fiction that he worked on was historical fiction. He wrote or attempted novels about Peter the Great, Ivan uh, the Terrible, um, and, and sort of figures like that from the Russian uh, perspective. Um, Yakov Pratazanov, um, our film director, uh, directed over 80 films, silent uh, but wonderful films. Um, he worked in the Russian Empire, he worked in France, he worked in Italy, he worked in Germany. Um, he, left, he left Bolshevik Russia in 1920, not because he had um, any sort of ideological oppositions to Bolshevism, but he was looking to expand opportunities. And at the time, uh, the film industry in particular was very international. And that's because with silent film, it is very easy to make a, and adjust a silent film for any audience of any language. You just have to change those, those title um, um, uh, bits of the movie, and then anybody can watch your movie. Um, <coughs> but he returns in 1923 to direct Ailita, and Ailita is really what brings these two men together uh, tonight. Um, and the film Ailita comes out in 1924. Um, and Pratazana, I don't believe, ever tried science fiction again. This is the first film adapt or film science fiction that came out uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, and that's probably for a good reason. Uh, this film is memorable, um, and in some ways, if, if, if the Soviets cared about box office success, um, it was a success in that respect, but it was not a success ideologically. All right, let's talk a little bit about Ailita, both the novel and the film. Um, so they are, um, uh, like I said, this is gonna be the last thing I'm gonna talk to you about tonight, um, and they are a new step in what is now appropriately called the Soviet imagination. They, they come out in 23 and 24, so we have a real Soviet Union, and in some ways, they are the first step of the Soviet, specifically, imagination. They were popular, not scientific, and as I said, not particularly ideological. The novel, a little bit more so. But served to make space top of mind, that is, uh, space exploration top of mind, and actually serve, and sort of create an imagination that would be particularly Soviet. Both novel and film are about a trip to Mars by an older engineer and a younger veteran. 
Lois, the engineer, creates a rocket ship to travel to Mars because he receives a puzzling telegram message. Mars, in both versions, is developed, organized, but dictatorially ruled first by engineers and then by Ailita as queen. The workers who produce the amazing feats of engineering on the planet are, are kept imprisoned. In the novel, they are interestingly frozen, so to not waste their energy. In the film, they are less interestingly just kept in caves. Um, Gusev, the veteran who goes with Loss to Mars, becomes a de facto rabble rouser of the workers of Mars, while Loss, the engineer, becomes enamored with the Queen Ailita, or the would-be Queen Ailita. She's not queen until the end. Um, the revolution on Mars fails, and, Gusev, um, and Loss and Gusev must flee. The ending uh, and the terms of the ending uh, are where the film greatly differs from the novel. In the film, Loss is motivated to go to Mars to avoid the consequences of murdering his wife out of jealousy, uh, only to return to realize that it was all a dream. Uh, the telegram message turns out to be an advertisement for tires, and Loss's wife is alive and well, and Loss burns his plans uh, of space travel, promising to stop his daydreaming. Uh, the uh, novel ends a little bit differently. We know there is a Mars. Uh, Lois is getting messages from Ailita. We kind of can see this sort of insidious way in which love might be distracting him from his own project. But uh, we, will, we are going to talk about the movie because the movie was much more memorable. We ready to watch a clip? Woo, yeah. It's silent. It's supposed to be silent because it's a silent. Um, kiss. <laughs> There's so many good clips. Unfortunately, well, uh, the movie is free, available on YouTube and other places. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the film, in particular, represented a lot of resources in its production and its advertising. There we go. Oh, whoa. That's everything all at once. There we go. How weird. Okay, we'll have to go backwards there. Um, okay, uh, so it represented a lot of resources in its production and its advertising. They say that for the Moscow premiere, Mezrapom Rus Studio transformed the theater into a constructivist set straight from the set of the film. And the constructivist set, we can kind of see here, I've created a little bit of a montage um, of the f of four pictures, but we see this constructivist set here that has this kind of uh, seemingly winding staircase that was uh, um, pretty reminiscent of another, um, of, of an imagined Soviet um, uh, uh, construction project. Uh, we also see here the imagination of the telescope. We can see here the effort um, at the uh, uh, worker rebellion. And it's hard to see, there's not, um, uh, but you can get a sense of the helmets and the, the, these, um, uh, the workers had to wear these masks here. <coughs> so, um, the film studio also used the newspaper Pravda to publish the same message that Los receives, Anta Udeli Uta, as a call for would-be moviegoers to come see the film. Nonetheless, the film was panned by critics and censors. And to be fair to those voices, the attitude of the movie to either social engineering or space travel is not entirely coherent. The most uh, sort of uh, memorable takeaways from the film are the sets, uh, specifically the Mars sets, and the costumes by Alexandra Exter, um, and uh, specifically of Ailita, the workers, and other uh, Martians. Um, and these, as I said, have clear nods to constructivism. The likes of Elisitsky, oops, oh, I'm gonna, sorry, I messed up that slide a lot. Well, there's not going to be a moment here, but let me just, uh, let's see. Anyway, I apologize um, for that, but, but we'll look at this. This is a Rochenko from 1920, and you can kind of see it's almost like a mobile here, and the inner sort of interlocking geom uh, geometric design here, it's the circles and the ovals are quite reminiscent here, and again, if we go back, oops, 
which is what direction am I going, to the construction of the set here um, is what people associated them with. <coughs> Um, this style was ascendant in the early, in nearly all art forms of the 1920s, as I said, from uh, visual art, photography, um, and architecture, and this gave Mars a flair of how the Soviet imagined itself. Um, but this made the failed revolution on Mars sit poorly with critics. Even more so was the lack of clarity about Moscow itself and the adventures of its engineers. The film has a lot of its runtime given over to the melodrama of Lost's life set in post-war, sorry, in post-Civil War Moscow. This was a time called NEP, or the New Economic Policy, um, which ushered in a brief period of relative economic and social liber liberalism, allowing for high-profile film productions like Ivita, and provoked both Bolshe uh, Bolshevik outrage and pre-revolutionary nostalgia. It also gave rise to a class of NEP men, who took advantage of public uh, of official positions within the Soviet hierarchy to bribe and steal their way into secret fortunes. And this is exactly what is uncovered in the Moscow of Ailita. But the problems become one of aesthetics. The proletarian Moscow is dirty under snow. Its, uh, its most upstanding citizens are potential victims of crime, both petty and, passion, and of passion. And finally, rather than there being any resolution to this problem, for example, the triumphant uh, building montage at the end of the extraordinary adventures of Mr. West in the land of the Bolsheviks, another excellent silent film which came out in 1924, um, the main characters cast aside all dreaming and the problems disappear, but the film offers no visual language for such a solution. Viewers are left with the delights of the Nep men parties and the modernist imagination of Mars and nothing really positive about the current situation in Soviet Moscow. Despite the, as, as, oops, whew, I'm just having a grand old time here, sorry folks. Uh, despite the aesthetic mismatches and the narrative failures of the film, it remained in Nep theaters and helped develop a sense of space exploration, fully imagined and developed. The novel too would see success as it was reworked for both children and young adults and encouraged uh, space imagination in the newest Soviets. The least uh, utopian of these entries I, pre uh, <laughs> I present tonight, Ailita, might have been the most effective at creating a sense of the anticipation already going on that I brought up in Parsinga Garen's Payekhli. <coughs> that, that return to Payekhli, as I, as I said, um, sort of creates uh, for us, um, or, or what I hope that, Kind of we have we have sort of explored uh, tonight is that sense that we have gone somewhere that the um, that when Gagarin goes to space there is as 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 one scholar put it there was a sense that we have already been to space um, among the Soviet public and so it seemed only natural that of course we would actually get someone to space. Likewise, I want to return to Tito's assessment of his atheism and uh, and as it is pitted against his belief in man. Hopefully we can see how simplistic that assessment was of how he got to space. Our people never represented a monolithic whole who thought of themselves as the only entities that had something to say about, <coughs> excuse me, about how, when, and why human beings might go to space. Um, and if you allow me, I know that I am sort of right at the end of my time, I do want to bring up my coda here. Um, if people have read any of the things that I have uh, talked about tonight, it would probably be Zamyatin's We. Um, and so the reason Zamyatin's we does not fit into this paradigm is honestly because it could not be part of a Soviet imagination. While people read it in the 1920s before it, uh, he attempted to have it published, he read it publicly, um, it appears in an English translation in 1924 and that really shuts the possibility of Zamyatin ever publishing again in the Soviet Union down, uh, much to his own chagrin. At the same time, we offers a kind of interesting synthesis of some of the, um, the threads of the Soviet imagination about space. And we could see those either as prescient or just working through some of these ideas of what it means to have a, a state-sponsored space program. Um, and I would say that we's sort of 
overarching interest is that of how do societies come together and fall apart. But in the very opening entry to we and we is set up like a diary from the point of view of D503, the name number, excuse me, the main number, who is known only as the creator of the integral um, until the very end. He, uh, that is D503 explains the integral and its relationship to space travel. In 120 days from now, the building of the integral will be finished. Near at hand is the great historic hour when the first integral will lift off into space. A thousand years ago, your heroic forebears subjected the whole planet Earth to the power of one state. It is for you to accomplish an even more glorious feat by means of the glass, the electric, the fire-breathing integral to integrate the indefinite equation of the universe. Thank you. So I was at uh, uh, Dr. Wong's presentation on Friday, and um, it, it, when you don't know this subject matter, you, it is hard to kind of figure out a question. So if you're like, I don't know that I have a question, totally fine, I'm not gonna be insulted by it. Something tell, Nick, did you have a question already? It wouldn't surprise me if Nick had a question. But, um, but if you need a moment to kind of sit with it or you wanna talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to also talk to you one-on-one -on -one, and if you don't wanna, but what, what's up, sir? I Lisa. I Lisa was based on like bullshit votes and stuff. They they said like this monarch that this tyrannical like this guy who used to fuck all the the intellectuals, all these very skilled workers. So they would kind of rise up to save the planet. Yes, but it's failed in that situation, yeah. How did it fail in that situation? Um well, the workers a are able to overthrow their uh, dictator, and then rather than able to actually organize something in, their, in its place, um, they are taken over by Ailita. She is the one who consolidates power. Nick and I are all our old friends. series will continue at 9 a.m. We will have three lectures tomorrow, one at 9 a.m. about music in space, one at 10 a.m. with Dr. Will Meyer, who will do anthropology and uh, the eclipse, and another lecture at 11 a.m., which will be part of religion, psychology, and philosophy and its view on the eclipse. Plus, our event, um, Eclipse Within the Gates, will start at 1 o'clock. You can come get your eclipse glasses then, and we hope to see everyone there. Thank you.